more time. from our hymnals hymn number 183 I will sing of Jesus love I will sing of Jesus love sing of him who first loved me for he left my cross of love and died on Calvary I will sing Next is hymn number 195, Showers of Blessing, 195.
Thank you for singing with us. Good morning and happy Sabbath, church family. Our call to worship this morning is going to be taken from the book of Psalm, chapter 91, verses 1 and 2. And I'll be singing, I'll be reading from the American Standard Version. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of Jehovah, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Amen. Amen. I'll stand and sing our opening hymn, 92.
You may be seated. Good morning, church. It's time for prayer. And uh, I know after Sabbath school, we did some praises and prayer requests to expedite that, but is there anyone else that has any requests that we can bring to the Lord this morning you want to share? Yes. Oh. Scarlet? Okay. Yes. Okay. Pray for our country. Yes. Yeah, you've brought her before. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, Mia. Okay. Yeah. Valerie. Yeah. Okay, Mary. Yeah. Well, I guess I have a, a prayer request, a prayer report that I pull out. <laughs> um, the prayer request is that my sister is very ill. She has bone cancer. And she was in remission. She's not anymore. She's not really responding to the chemo. Amen. And my sister, I don't know if she's actually doing her life with the Lord, but um, she is reading the Bible, and I try so many times. I got so close so many times. But Charlotte got for a lot further than me. She got to read the Bible, and she said, my sister said she has a list of people she prays for every night. It includes the daughter of Amen. That's right. Anyway. Yeah, we'll keep your your sisters come around then. People don't care what we know. They want to know that we care. Mm -hmm. The fruits are there. Uh, you know, the apples are on the apple tree. And so I'm not going to go to the doctor because it's my personal belief that the only thing I make sure the animals are having is not the right thing. You know, the main thing is the great commission and love. And those are the things that I see in them. Mm -hmm. So I'm back. Well, we're glad that you came today. Yes, Virgin. Okay, our missing members or people who are homesick or something. Any silent prayer requests? Yeah, and yeah, Sean? I just want to praise God for the Holy Scripture, the wisdom found there, and that we obey to find righteousness and peace. Mm hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and the, 
young people and, the, and everyone else who's studying for baptism. There's a group of us here, and uh, we want to lift them up to you. So let's kneel together and seek the Lord. Father, we're just grateful that uh, you've brought us all together today. Um, this group of people, maybe we'll never all be together again at this, this time and space, of course. And uh, so we appreciate the uniqueness of this moment. And uh, you've spoke to us all in different ways. Some come out of uh, duty, some come out of need, some come out of habit. Um, these are okay th all okay things. Uh, we're just glad that we um, listened to you today and, and we came. And uh, we invite you to come be with us uh, by your spirit that you'll speak to us, that you'll tell us things and show us things that just each of us need to hear on an individual basis. We're all in different places. We're all coming from different backgrounds. Um, some of our backgrounds are similar, but some aren't. So we're just grateful for uh, the uniqueness of, of humanity and how we can all come together right now, right here. Uh, we think of all the people that were mentioned. Um, we have little people hurt and sick in the hospital. We have our loved ones hurt and sick, battling with ailments and their bodies are breaking down. There's mental anguish that our loved ones are going through. Um, it, sometimes it's all overwhelming and, uh, and just frankly scary. So we give all those to you this morning. We, I thank you for everyone who mentioned those things. Um, we believe that you can intervene in a physical way, but we like also and believe that you intervene in a spiritual way. And sometimes the bodies do fail, but the mind and the soul come to you in that process. And uh, we don't always understand why that has to be um, and why the innocent have to suffer. Um, but we know one day that this will all end too. So we pray you give us endurance. We pray you help us not to give up praying and seeking uh, your intervention in all these things. So we... Um, lift up all those names to you now. And um, we think of our members who aren't here for various reasons. We pray a blessing upon them. We pray for our pastor and his wife who are um, somewhere else today. Just bless their ministry and we thank you for them. And uh, I just thank you for everyone's dedication and, and making church happen here. All the people that work behind the scenes and I ask a blessing upon their ministries. Again, we invite your Holy Spirit to touch each of us in a powerful way. Help us to believe, with, believe in you um, no matter the heavens may fall is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord for our children and our keiki. We ask that you come forward so that you can collect the keiki offering. And this is to support children's ministries. Our cakey story is going to be given by Sister Vivian this morning. I'm going to share with you a very, very little story this morning, okay? Was a great, great violin player. His name was Paganini. I don't know if you heard about him, but he was amazing. He was the top, top violin players the whole, whole time. Even up to today, no one can play like Paganini. But Paganini had a very bad habit. Paganini, he used to go out and drink a lot of alcohol. He used to gamble, lose all his money. He was an excellent player, but he had bad habits. And one time he was in a casino player playing and he lost his violin. He had this amazing violin custom made for him, specific for him, but he lost gambling. So he had to give it to them. So here we go. He totally forgot next week was a concert for the king. And Paganini didn't know what to do. So he just went to the store, got a violin, borrowed, from, borrowed a violin because he had no money, and he started playing. And that was this beautiful place and was in a theater and everybody was there. And Paganini was not his violin, but he was a master. He was excellent. And he started playing the violin. Do you know what happened? with this big, big choir, one of the string broke. And everybody, he's gonna stop playing. And Paganini didn't, and he continues to play, and continues to play. Second string broke, third string broke. And everybody says, unbelievable, he's gonna stop. And the music was beautiful than ever. 
the story tells us that one string, he finally finished the concert with one string. So when I read that story, do you know what it is? Each one of us, we are a violin. Doesn't matter, we are, like I have a broken leg today that I'm trying to fix here. Doesn't matter how spiritual broken, doesn't matter anything. We are different violins. We were made perfect for the master. The master made us perfect. But it's several types of violin. Not good one, broken one. The most important thing, when we are a violin in the hand of the masters, we will play the sounds that comes from us is awesome sounds because God can make us awesome. Doesn't matter what type of violin and how many strings it's broken in us, he always can fix us. Let's close our eyes and do our prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much that we're here on the Sabbath. It's raining. A lot of people couldn't get here, but we are here to praise you and to thank you. Doesn't matter what kind of violin we are, how broken, doesn't matter if we're crooked, we know in your hands we always, always perform and comes with beautiful sounds. Thank you, dear Lord, for Sabbath day, Sabbath day, and thank you so much for being here with us. Amen. We thank you, Lord, for blessing us and being with us, Lord. We thank you for watching each step that we take, each thought that we have, and that we are closer and closer to you today. We ask that these tithes and offerings will be a blessing for your ministry and that you will continue to do your work and your will, Lord. Thank you again for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
the beautiful music given by Rusty, Debbie, Aaron, and Grace. Thank you so much. It's beautiful. Praise God. Our scripture reading this morning is going to be taken from the King James Version. I'll give you a moment to turn to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 16. First Peter chapter 3, verse 16, King James Version says, Having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his scripture. Oh, Grace, how am I supposed to talk after that? My word, that was beautiful. If they only knew that you jump off cliffs and do crazy things, you're like an angel. So thank you very much, Cottrell's. Okay, um, I'm not a preacher, so just so you know, I'm the school teacher here. Um, last time I was up here, uh, Lee and I were up here together. We kind of talked about our story how we came to the Lord. Were some of you here? We were kind of, in a nutshell, we were basically tree-hugging dirt worshipers that came to fall in love with the maker of the tree and the maker of the dirt. So that's kind of where, um, where I'm coming from. So we're not, I'm not going to continue with that. I'm just going to talk about something that happened to me a couple years ago. Um, so I don't typically take a verse and preach on it. I typically just take a snapshot of my life and tell you everything I'm going through um, to the consternation of my wife sometimes. So she doesn't always like that. Um, I love to read. When I was in third grade, I could barely read. I read kind of with the first and second graders. And uh, I had a teacher that put a lot of time and effort into me when I was in third grade. And I learned to read, and um, I had speech issues and all of that. So um, when I could finally learn to read, I really started to read. And um, I did study history in school, a lot of reading, um, unfortunately, sometimes when you study history. Um, so I love to read. I love to read all kinds of books, um, and not just Adventist books, all sorts of books, uh, Christian authors, non-Christian authors. Um, I like a challenge. I don't ever want to be accused of having my head in the sand on, as in regards to being a Christian because some Christians get viewed that way. Um, so a particular book came along a couple years ago. It was on a friend's shelf, and I asked if I could borrow it. It was called The Zealot, The Life and Times of Jesus of Nazareth by Reza Aslan. And it was a New York Times bestseller. Uh, it looked pretty intriguing. Um, it was, uh, I have a little print up of kind of a, a snapshot of the book. It said, meticulously researched biography that challenged the long-held assumptions of Jesus. And it was a CNN um, reporter host that kind of, that's what this guy did. Um, so it was like one of the best books of the year a couple years ago. And I was kind of like, yeah, I'll take a challenge. You know, I don't know if, I didn't really research the author, or where he came from, what his belief was. Um, I didn't buy the book, you know, I just borrowed it. So I, I started reading it. And um, another little snapshot says that the author was sifting through centuries of myth making, shedding new light. And I'm like, okay, I want to learn more about Jesus. And uh, so I started reading this book. And. Um, about halfway through, I had to put it down. It was like, usually I can kind of push through a book that I don't necessarily agree with, but just to kind of take out snapshots of, you know, that what appealed to me and my faith. But this guy was dismantling everything that I kind of thought I knew about Jesus. Um, a couple, you know, a few, just a kind of a snapshot of a few things he said. He was, he, would, he was saying like things like, Nazareth was too small for a synagogue, and we know Jesus went to church in his hometown. This author said Nazareth was too poor to support a carpenter. You know, that's what Jesus did and his dad did. And that Jesus' main mission was to overthrow the Romans. Um, thus the, the title, The Zealot. So I kind of put, put the book down. I'm like, eh. But it kind of got under my skin, and I kind of started to have a little problem, like a kind of a faith crisis. 
And um, kind of another one. I don't know if you ever had a faith crisis where you just kind of like every few years you kind of feel you need a reconversion. Like you kind of just have these assumptions or we take things for granted what we believe. And so I kind of needed to kind of, I was a little rattled. And um, so uh, I needed kind of a reconversion. I'd been a, an, a, I've been an Adventist Christian for 26 years. Um, you know, I wasn't, as some of you know from our story, I wasn't raised in, in a Christian home by any means at all, very secular home. You know, I've been employed by the church for 20 years as a school teacher. I talk to kids every day about Jesus, but yet I was kind of going through this turmoil inside, wondering if I had followed a cunningly devised fable. Uh, that verse in the, in the Bible. Uh, cunningly, have I followed a cunningly devised fable? Um... And, you know, I was like, am I such, I'm, I kind of felt like I was a doubting Thomas. You know, I'm kind of in with the group, but I'm not really all the way in. Um, and this book got me wondering again. Um, so I started looking, I have a lot of other books on my shelf. So I started pulling down these apologetics books, books that kind of defend the faith. Books entitled like A Skeptic Search for God, Reaching for the Invisible God, and Jesus Among Other Gods and another one, More Than a Carpenter. These are books that kind of take the um, analytical or the skeptical mind and kind of help someone coming from a secular world get a grip of this world of faith. So I had to kind of reread these books. You see, I was raised in this totally secular home, went to public school through my whole life, public university, studied a fair amount of science, was steeped in evolution and critical thinking. So um, that was a long time ago, but yet I was having this flash of doubt. And, you know, before we moved here in July, we, we were living in a very secular city of Madison, Wisconsin, very educated college town. And many of my friends were non-Christians who had strong views about faith and science. And I loved interacting with them, you know. I just love, and, you know, I wonder, should we have more friends that are non-Christian than Christian or non-Adventist than Adventist? You know, should we be mingling? And uh, I love interacting with people like that. But it was challenging. It was very challenging. And, uh, and it kept me on my toes for sure. And this is kind of, th we were living in Madison when I kind of went through this, this time. You know, kind of, I think, all a culmination of the book and then living in that city and having all my friends. And, you know, I was starting to getting worn down, so to speak. But, you know, Jesus asks us in Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven 37 to love God with our heart, our soul, and our mind. And uh, when I think of our minds, I can't help but see an intellectual component. God wants us to have an intelligent faith that can answer challenging questions that come from within inside us and, and outside. So sometimes I need to be reminded that the Bible is a reliable source, that creation is a viable alternative to evolution, and that Jesus was who he said he was. I want my faith in Jesus to be based on reason, not just hope, I want to be able to answer with confidence the skeptics' questions and inquiries. And, you know, Christians sometimes get labeled as being weak-minded um, to the science-minded, and I just didn't want that label. I hunger to know God like a friend. We speak of our relationship with God in these friend terms uh, where we talk to each other, we spend time together, we share secrets with our friends. But, you know, in the most practical way, Jesus isn't like an earthly friend at all because I can't punch him, you know? I can't touch him. Um, I can't look into his eyes like we can look into each other's eyes. And um, so how can I have a relationship with someone I, I'm not sure is quite around, you know, all the time? So these are my challenges, and I don't know if they're yours either, uh, or if you've ever asked these questions. Um, so bear with me as I kind of process with you what I went through to kind of get a grapple on what I believe. The faith versus doubt battle is as old as humankind. C.S. Lewis said, we need to be reminded more than instructed. St. Augustine said that he wished to be certain that God exists as he was certain that seven and three make ten. The Bible's full of stories where God has revealed in powerful ways to his people. I long, too, with, I long, too, for contact with the unseen. I thirst for visibility, like having Jesus materialize in front of me. 
Yet I know the verse that says an unbelieving and perverse generation seeks a sign. Matthew 12, 39. And also the verse, blessed are they that have not seen me and yet have believed. John 20, 29, which he said to Thomas, no less. So it's in me to believe. I know we're pre-wired to believe in something. We're just all, we come like pre-wired to believe in something. And, you know, ultimately to believe in God. Um, we just get distracted. We get led astray um, from what we should be believing. So um, I'm going to go through three reasons that I kind of came to for reason to believe in this world we live in now. One of the most common rationales of those who don't believe in God is that they're waiting for proof of God's existence. And we live in the real science age and technology where people like to be proved uh, things are true. Unfortunately for them, that proof may never come. Well, at least not in the way we are expecting. In today's world, science rules. If God can't be proven scientifically, then men, many people say God must not exist. The problem with that viewpoint is that the scientific method itself now, the scientific method is a very important and beneficial thing. You know, I teach it uh, at school. We use it, but it has limitations. The scientific method can only prove observable things that are repeatable, right, through experimentation. For instance, one can prove via the scientific method that gunpowder is flammable. And I had kids doing a science fair project with gunpowder, and they did prove that um, at home, not at school. Um, it was bad. I, I couldn't believe it. But anyway, um, however, one could not prove via the scientific method that Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, and you would be laughed out of town if you were to suggest that such a thing didn't happen simply because you couldn't prove it scientifically, so to repeat it through an experiment. Um, but if you can't prove something to be scientifically true, can it still be true? I think so, yes. So there's another kind of proof that's done all the time, and this is called legal historical proof. This is used to show something is true beyond a reasonable doubt, and it rely, relies on three things, oral testimony, written testimony, and physical exhibits. It's been used to prove things like, did George Washington live? Was Abraham Lincoln assassinated? Was Martin Luther King a civil rights leader? And most importantly, was Jesus raised from the dead? Now, the Bible is a written testimony, and Bible manuscripts found by archaeologists and shepherd boys qualify as physical exhibits. No document has been so thoroughly studied, criticized, and dissected over the past 2,000 years. The beauty of the Bible is that its manuscripts date only a few years from the actual events. So this timing is far too early for the Gospels to be turned into legends. In other writings of antiquity, the manuscripts date hundreds if not thousands of years after the supposed writing. Examples of, of, of where there's a long stretch between when it actually happened and when the first writing occurred are the writings of Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, Caesar. These writings stand the test of literary scholars, so the Bible should for sure. If someone claims the Bible is unreliable source, they must also claim that all literature of antiquity is as well. And this encourages me because as a history major, I had to read all these books, and I believe them to be true. So I should never really doubt the Bible to be true, no matter what people may claim. The Bible is a trustworthy and historically reliable source in its story about Jesus. Another test of uh, reliability is our archaeological evidence. And again and again, archaeological discoveries have verified the accuracy of the historical and cultural references in the Bible. The more they dig, the more the Bible is confirmed. Uh, it is important to note that Near Eastern archaeology has demonstrated the historical and geographical reliability of the Bible in many important areas. So maybe you, that's not an issue for you, but for me, I needed to kind of be reminded that these aren't, you know, that the Bible's not a myth book and, um, you know, that these stories aren't, legends, so to speak. Another reason to believe um, is who would die for a lie? What if, you know, and you've heard this story, maybe what if the disciples made this all up? They're in the upper room, Jesus was crucified, and they're just like, okay, we're just gonna, we're just gonna make up that he's alive. So what if they fabricated the resurrection story? Of the 12 disciples, how many died a martyr's death? Do you know? 11 of them, 
John was exiled. He got to die as an old man. Um, 12, um, 11 of the 12 died a martyr's death. Now, a lot of people have died for a lie, but could 11 do it and as martyrs? And if the resurrection hadn't taken place, these guys obviously would have n known it. Could they have fooled the world all these years? These guys, and I think not, the, these guys witnessed the resurrected Jesus. Yes, they doubted at first. They all ran away. Uh, they were all cowards at first. That's clear. But once assured, once they saw the resurrected Jesus, they never, ever doubted again. And these guys ended up turning the world upside down. And the world is a different place because of it. Totally different place. Think of how absurd it would be for a band of defeated cowards hiding in a room to be transformed in a few days into a company that no persecution could silence because they'd made it all up. The legal minds of today state the resurrection is one of the best supported events in history according to the laws of legal evidence. George Ladd, a philosopher of law, says, quote, a believer in Jesus Christ today can have complete confidence, as did the first Christians, that his faith or her faith is based not on myth or legend, but on a solid historical fact of the risen Christ and the empty tomb. Amen. Another reason to believe is um, science. And this is the area that I probably had the hardest time with when I came to the Lord. Um, you know, when you're young and going to college and studying, taking biology and you just are so impressed. I was just so in evolution and the old earth was really impressed into me. And uh, geology was kind of a, major, uh, a minor for me that I really enjoyed studying. Um, so when I became came to Jesus, I had to kind of get a grip on, like, what is intelligent design? What is creation? And start to, and this, you know, in the 90s, the, it really, the science really wasn't caught up to the idea of intelligent design and uh, what that means. And uh, so it was difficult at first. Um, and again, all, all my friends, you know, coming from the science world and just scoffing at me at times. And yet we all, lo we love each other, but yet we had these passionate discussions so I'm always trying to find new information that helps me believe in this world where most other people believe something different about how we came to be. Kurt Goodell, famous mathematician, has shown that no system of thought can prove anything within its own system. In other words, we really can't prove the process of thinking if we actually have to think to do it. So his point is that nothing is 100% provable or 100% explainable, which opens the door to the exercise of faith. The mathematicians are the thorn in the side of the evolutionists. They have concluded that there's just not been enough time, if the earth is supposedly four and a half billion years old, there's not enough time at the rate of how things evolve, quote unquote, to have evolved us to where we are now. Not even to evolve the human eye to its current state. Just to have single cells spontaneously form in the so-called primordial soup that Earth was long ago, this was asked of four probability mathematicians from MIT, Los Alamos, and the University of Paris. And these mathematicians concluded that the probability that we are here now, if natural selection had to choose from all the blindingly large numbers of alternative systems by means of the mechanisms described in current evolutionary theory, is virtually zero. It's just, scientists can't come up with it. They kind of have this theory, right? So just for a single cell to have originally appeared, infinity amount of time would be necessary. And this presumes that there's some natural means to add life to basic matter. And this is something that has never been observed, nor do human beings have the slightest idea how to add life to matter. So even if there had been infinite time to allow the first cell to be put together, we know of no way that evolution could bring a life to such a cell. And in the absence of naturalistic theory that relies upon random chance, there's only one alternative, some form of intelligent design. Science has come so far in the last 200 years that it's gotten to the point that it's clear that there can never be a complete scientific account of the universe that can be empirically proven. And this means that science must use faith to justify its positions. Now, intelligent design takes faith. 
because we're all using it a fair amount, because we don't have all the questions either. But in the other side of the argument, evolution might even require more faith. <laughs> Some scientists hate to hear this. And when I throw that into my conversation, uh, my buddies don't like that. But, and what they really don't like is when I tell them that evolution is a belief system as much as it's a science. Michael Ruse is a well-known evolutionist, scientist, and defender of evolution. And he wrote, quote, my area of expertise is the clash between evolutionists and creationists. And my analysis is that we have no simple clash between science and religion, but rather between two religions. So if we can realize that, that really it's two religions that are clashing each other, two belief systems, we don't have to always feel that you know, we don't have enough information to defend what we believe about how we came to be. Another area is the world of quantum physics, and scientists have been able to start looking at the world that we can't see, the atomic world, that kind of everything's made of, right? Atoms and everything atoms are made of. And uh, I want to show a video about the um, double slit experiment, which has scientists completely baffled. So, Coltron, can you pull up that video? I was going to explain it, but this... This little cartoon really makes it um, clear. Okay, so let's listen to this. And here we are, the granddaddy of all quantum weirdness, the infamous double slit experiment. To understand this experiment, we first need to see how particles, or little balls of matter, act. If we randomly shoot a small object, say a marble, at the screen, we see a pattern on the back wall where they went through the slit and hit. Now, if we add a second slit, we would expect to see a second band duplicated to the right. Now, let's look at waves. The waves hit the slit and radiate out, striking the back wall with the most intensity directly in line with the slit. The line of brightness on the back screen shows that intensity. This is similar to the line the marbles make. But when we add the second slit, something different happens. If the top of one wave meets the bottom of another wave, they cancel each other out. So now there is an interference pattern on the back wall. Places where the two tops meet are the highest intensity, the bright lines, and where they cancel, there is nothing. So, when we throw things, that is, matter, through two slits, we get this, two bands of hits. And with waves, we get an interference pattern of many bands. Good so far. Now. Let's go quantum. <laughs> An electron is a tiny, tiny bit of matter, like a tiny marble. Let's fire a stream through one slit. It behaves just like the marble, a single band. So, if we shoot these tiny bits through two slits, we should get, like the marbles, bands. What? An interference pattern. We fired electrons, tiny bits of matter through. We get a pattern like waves, not like little marbles. How? How could pieces of matter create an interference pattern like a wave? It doesn't make sense. But physicists are clever. They thought Maybe those little balls are bouncing off each other and creating that pattern. So, they decide to shoot electrons through one at a time. There is no way they could interfere with each other. But after an hour of this, the same interference pattern is seen to emerge. The conclusion is inescapable. The single electron leaves as a particle, becomes a wave of potentials, goes through both slits, and interferes with itself to hit the wall like a particle. 
but mathematically, it's even stranger. It goes through both slits, and it goes through neither. And it goes through just one, and it goes through just the other. All of these possibilities are in superposition with each other. But physicists were completely baffled by this. So they decided to peek and see which slit it actually goes through. They put a measuring device by one slit to see which one it went through and let it fly. <laughs> but the quantum world is far more mysterious than they could have imagined. When they observed, the electron went back to behaving like a little marble. It produced a pattern of two bands, not an interference pattern of many. The very act of measuring or observing which slit it went through meant it only went through one, not both. The electron decided to act differently, as though it was aware it was being watched. And it was here that physicists stepped forever into the strange never world of quantum events. What is matter? Bubbles or waves? And waves of what? And what does an observer have to do with any of this? The observer collapsed the wave function simply by observing. So, I mean, that could be a whole sermon in itself as far as the observer and all that. But m the point I wanted to bring out is that in, that in the quantum world, matter is not following the rules of nature, so to speak, the rules of physics. Um, so as they study smaller and smaller things, in order to understand what we're made of, um, mo more things don't make sense. So, um, they kind of, th they don't really know why that happens. And um, so, so what if I was to tell you the most intelligent, respected people in modern history, um, this person came to believe in God because of evidence? It happened. There was this atheist physicist who had worked out a model of how the universe functioned. His model was so correct to, to this day, with all the vast knowledge we have about the universe, his model has yet to be disproved. Do you know who I'm thinking of? Einstein, Albert Einstein, in his model of general theory of relativity. You see, when Einstein began to consider the implications of his theory, he realized that the universe had to have a beginning. And if it had a beginning, it had to have someone or something that began it. Einstein, not wanting to accept the idea that God existed, tried to tinker with this theory, but his tinkering never quite worked out. And he eventually was forced to conclude that there was, in fact, some unknown power that created the universe. Now, it's not like he became a Protestant or evangelical Christian, but, um, but he became convinced that something had to start it all. In the theory of special relativity that Einstein came up with in 1905, he considered if a train was coming at you at 200 miles an hour and you drive towards the train at 50 miles an hour, you would meet the train at what speed? 250, right? You add them together, okay? Classic physics. Kids in high school do this all the time, little experiments. So if we used a beam of light instead of a train, now a beam of light goes a little faster than a train, 300,000 kilometers per second, speed of light. And if I, so if the beam of light was coming at me at that speed and I started to go at the beam of light at say 100,000 kilometers a second, Logic would state that I would reach the beam of light at 400,000 kilometers per second, right? 300,000 plus 100,000. But that would be wrong. The beam of light would still reach me at 300,000 kilometers a second. No matter what speed I go towards the light or away from it, there's no difference. The light will reach me always at 300,000 kilometers um, a second, no matter my speed relative to it. That's where the theory of relativity comes from. So logically, this is impossible. But the reality, of the, the reality is that the speed of light doesn't correlate with reason or rational thinking. The explanation is that 
time, something has to change, right? Time is what changes. So the faster one goes um, to keep up with the beam of light, um, the beam of light, or let me, let me read this to make it clear. Um, the explanation is that time slows down the faster one moves. So to keep the beam of light traveling the same speed, so even though I'm traveling toward the beam of light at some speed, a second for me will slow down enough to ensure that the beam of light will reach me at that 300,000 kilometers a second. Now I'm like, I know you're like, okay, what's he talking about? Basically, light does not follow the rules of science. Um, and that's where people start talking about time travel, you know, if you can go to speed of light, you know, science fiction writers will like, if you can go to speed of light, you could figure out a way to, because time changes, you can time travel, but we're not going to go into that. Um, my point about uh, talking about um, the theory of relativity and the double slit experiment is that um, things in nature don't always follow the rules of nature or the rules that man has, you know, written down through experimentation. At times, uh, things in nature act irrational, illogical, and unbelievable and beyond common sense. Now, these sound like charges often leveled against the Bible and Christianity, not science. So my point is that the more scientists get deeper into science, the more questions they have, and the more they're just like throwing up their hands like, uh, this is confusing, and it's not rational. Science has pushed the boundary so far and in many directions that in our day and age, there's more room, not less, for faith. Because they have to come up with faith answers to their questions as well. So to re reject religious faith because it's unreasonable is unreasonable in the age of quantum physics. Faith actually seems more logical than many empirically measured sciences, which is reassuring to me. You know, Jesus being resurrected after dying on the cross is either true or it's an a lie. And if it's a lie, then Jesus was just another murdered Jew. And many, many, many ages, you know, many, many people since then have put all this false hope in him. Um, that's what that book, The Zealot, was basically saying. Jesus was a zealot. He had a political goal. Um, but if the cross is true, then all the evil and selfishness we have and will commit falls on Jesus to spare us eternal death and thus the cross has an absolute moral claim on us whether we believe it or not. So whether you believe what, what Jesus did for us, it still has a claim on your life and you can choose to dis, disbelieve it, of course. Now I know I will never be able to totally prove scientifically things that needed to be, need to be taken on faith. God doesn't work that way. But the things we've talked about today show me, and I hope you, how reasonable it is to believe in something that at times defies reason. We use faith to believe in things we can't see or understand. I believe an electron is real, but I've never seen one. I can't see Jesus, but I can believe he's real too, and I hope you do. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, this is not a definition of faith as much as it is an explanation of what faith does. Faith treats the things hoped for as reality. The evidence of things not seen means proof or conviction. So another way we can phrase that, Hebrews 11.1, 1, is faith itself proves that what is unseen is real. So by all of us believing in Jesus, it's telling the world something. And our lives that are changed and transformed by Jesus tells the world something. Tolstoy wrote, quote, Once man has realized that death is the end of everything, there's nothing worse than life itself. That's a very sad idea. And this is the fear I had as a young man before I came to know Jesus. I'm like, when I close my eyes and die, that's it? It's done? Like, that's it? And it was, uh, and in, sometimes in my weakest moments, that's sometimes what I grapple with. But God, through Jesus Christ, answers this fear. Ansem wrote, I quote, I believe that I may understand, unquote. I believe that I may understand. Faith can be something that is built on solid truth, and this truth may not be empirically provable, but there are enough evidences to show that it is true and can be relied upon. This truth helps us to understand why we are here and where we are going. So in conclusion, I want to quote Clifford Goldstein, he says, faith isn't a leap, o 
Faith isn't a leap of faith into the absurd. It's a leap over it. What is absurd is to live without hope when hope has been offered, unquote. So Jesus, through the Bible and its teachings, is the hope that's been offered to us. Let's claim it. Let's believe it in a more real way than ever is my prayer for us. We're going to close with uh, I Know Whom I've Believed, number 512. It's 511? Thank you. Let's pray. Father, we uh, are all wired to believe, and uh, you want more than anything for us to believe in you, and we thank you for the gift of faith. We pray that we can do those things, believe those things that will make our faith stronger. And when we do have doubts, Lord, pray that we can speak to you, speak to our loved ones and friends who love you, and um, get the wisdom of the multitude that help us. We thank you that science can direct us to you, that nature draws us to you, and that your word draws us to you, Lord. We just pray that we'll be open to receive the drawing as you're drawing all of the world to you now. Is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.